lecture on chapter 9. It's actually the lecture on chapter 9, and then there's a slight rewind back to chapter 6. I believe it is the chapter on fats. The highlight section, if you remember, in that chapter was all about alcohol, and I think alcohol fits a little bit better with the discussion about water and fluids, so um, I've sort of inserted it here. So when we're talking about alcohol, I'm getting that from that last part of chapter 6. Okay, so chapter 9 is all about water and minerals. Um, so this is sort of the end of our micronutrients unit. So chapters 8 and 9 cover the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. And then also water is stuck in this chapter with minerals because water and minerals really go hand in hand. So the first part actually talks about water, so we digress a little bit from our micronutrients to first discuss water. So water is it's in, in its own class. It's its own class of nutrient, excuse me, and it's actually a, an extremely important one. Um, we can live without food for several weeks. Uh, our body will just start digesting itself. We can't live without water for more than about a week. So, um, uh, water is pretty important. Water is made up of oxygen and hydrogen. It's H2O. This is what a water molecule looks like. And it's a major component of our body. 50 to 75 percent of an adult's body weight is water, um, depending on their body makeup, their age, different things. So some things that can affect fluid composition of a body. Um, one, tissue type. So lean tissues, like muscle, have higher fluid content than fat tissue. And it makes sense if you think about it, because lipids and water don't mix, so you can't have much water in lipid tissue, fat tissue, adipose tissue. So my little picture here, as for, taken from one of those, you know, like weight loss ads where you've got like the, you know, obese guy, and then like he takes some supplement or does P90X, and he turns out, you know, really cut. Um, so anyways, supposing that these two men weighed the same amount, um, this one has more fat tissue, this one has more muscle tissue, so this guy on the right will actually have more water, more body water, because he has more lean tissue than fat tissue. Um, gender also makes a difference in uh, body water composition. Again, females have more fat tissue than males do, so males have more water than females do. And finally, age can make a difference as, well, when we're infants, we actually have a very high content of body water, uh, like on the higher end, like 70, 75%. And as you age, uh, particularly as you become an older adult or an elderly adult, you start losing muscle mass and you start losing water. So um, in this picture, grandma has far less water than the little baby. Um, in terms of percent. Okay, so uh, water has a lot of functions in our body. In previous lectures, I've spent several slides going over the functions of, of a given nutrient. Um, but in this one, I've just decided to stick with the book's format and just feature a table and sort of go through it um, individually. So water is an excellent solvent. That means that it can dissolve things very well. Um, dissolve things like nutrients, glucose, whether it be glucose or amino acids, um, or minerals and vitamins. It can also dissolve our waste products, all the waste products from cells. So um, because of its amazing solvent abilities, it is a really good um, transporter of substances, including wastes, which it helps remove from our system, and um, transporting substances that we need, like uh, glucose, to different cells, okay? And it does that through all these different bodily fluids, blood being the major one that transports things. Water is also a component of saliva. In fact, uh, when you get thirsty, when you're dehydrated and you're low, your body's water content is low, one of the first signs of thirst is what? Dry mouth. 
right? Because your body stops producing saliva if it doesn't have enough water to do more important things. So um, saliva comes from body water. Sweat is really important for regulating body temperature. It's a really important function of body water. Um, your body can really only stand to be the temperature of your body can only stand to be raised a couple of degrees before it start a, starts actually denaturing enzymes and denaturing proteins in your body, unfolding them, and causing you to um, not function properly and ultimately can lead to coma and death. Um, tears of fluid, mucus in your nasal cavity, in your intestinal cavity, um, and joint fluid. So which keeps your joints lubricated, keeps bones from chafing against each other, um, keeps them happy. So, so water also participates in a lot of chemical reactions. A lot of reactions can't take place without water. And it also helps to maintain proper pH balance. So water has a lot of important functions. Um, transporting substances we need is very key. Regulating body temperature we would die without that ability. So um, water is a pretty important nutrient. So water has this very special ability to go wherever it wants, essentially. So all of the cells in our body are covered with a cell membrane, a plasma membrane, and that membrane is something we call selectively permeable. It means that certain things are allowed in and out and other things are sort of, you know, stopped at the door. So water happens to be one of those molecules that has free passage through these selectively permeable membranes. And that passage of water from an area um, of low concentration to an area of high concentration is called osmosis. So here we go. We have sort of a, a beaker that's representing um, there's a membrane here, a fake membrane, that represents the cell membrane. It's selectively permeable. And on one side of this membrane, you have pure water. And on the other side, you have water plus a solute. A solute is anything that's dissolved in water. So it could be glucose, it could be sodium, whatever. Let's say it's glucose. So water is attracted to solute. It's attracted to dissolved particles, whether it be glucose, albumin, sodium, potassium, whatever. Um, so the sodium or glucose molecules are too big. They can't pass through this selectively permeable membrane. They're not selected to freely pass through. So they have to stay on this side. But water can pass through, and it will. It's attracted to solute molecules. And so it will move over to the other side to try to balance out and dilute that solution. Okay, and this happens in our bodies all the time. This is what electrolyte balance and fluid balance is all about, and we'll get to that in a couple of slides. So body water is all, I mean, your body, your, your body is 50 to 75% water. Where is all that water kept, all right? A majority of that water, surprisingly enough, is actually found inside your cells. So two-thirds of the body's water is intracellular, meaning it's within the cells. Um, most people think, when they think body water, they think of fluids, like blood and lymph and tears, which are all part of the extracellular fluids, which is only a third of our body water. So most of the water in the body is contained in cells, which makes sense if you think about a cell and how it has that cytoplasm, that gel-like substance that fills it up, that's gonna be a high content of water. And most of your body is made up of cells. It's made up of tissues that are made up of cells. And only a very small amount of your body is actually fluid, like blood. So most body water, two thirds of the water in your body is stored inside cells, intracellular. The other third is extracellular and there's two sort of places, two components of extracellular fluid. There's interstitial fluid, which is the fluid that sort of uh, bathes cells in the tissue. So there's fluid between cells. They're not all like, cells aren't all like glued together and uh, they sort of sit in a bath. Um, and that bath is called the extracellular fluid or the interstitial fluid. 
Um, and the other type of extracellular fluid is blood plasma, which is the fluid portion of the blood. So not the red blood cells. You know, when you, um, where's my other picture of blood? Right here. The blood plasma, this fluid portion, the straw colored portion of blood. If you take a tube of blood and you spin it down so all of the red blood cells fall to the bottom, you get this uh, plasma at the top, which is mostly water with some stuff dissolved into it. Okay, so body water, most of it's intracellular, some of it is extracellular. Now, here's where we get to the fluid balance part, this whole uh, water moving inside and outside of cells. So the body maintains its fluid status, its hydration, okay, by regulating the number of ions. Okay, these are basically minerals that are inside of cells and those that are outside of cells. And those minerals and ions are solutes. They're dissolved in water and water is attracted to them. So if you move, if you manipulate these different ions, if you move them, water follows them. And that's how we achieve water balance. So um, these minerals will all come back to haunt you in a few minutes when we talk about body minerals. So might as well go ahead and point it out here that um, the different minerals that play a big role in fluid balance are sodium, chloride, potassium, and also phosphorus is another one. This A minus just means any other negatively charged um, molecule. So anyway, you have intracellular ions and you have extracellular ions. And we'll talk about how sodium helps to regulate blood fluids or helps to regulate extracellular fluid, and potassium helps to regulate intracellular fluid because potassium is higher inside the cell than it is outside the cell. See, it's very small in the extracellular fluid, whereas sodium is very high outside the cell and very low inside the cell. But they're both positively charged, so you have sort of equal charges on both sides, but you have differences in the... Um, in the types of ions. So this will become more clear in a minute. Oh, here it is, I already have it. So maintaining fluid balance is all about balancing the number of mainly sodium and potassium on either side of the cell, okay? So ideally, in a homeostasis situation, you have equal amounts of sodium on the outside and potassium on the inside. It's like simplifying it a little bit here. Um, but if you have a situation where your sodium is reduced, uh, like if you don't get enough sodium in your diet or if you drink too much water and you dilute the amount of sodium in your blood, okay, um, what happens is you get less sodium on the outside and more potassium on the inside. And what does water do with osmosis? It follows solute. It moves from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Well, there's more particles, solute particles, inside the cell than there are outside the cell, so water's going to move into the cell. And normally, you know, water moving into a cell is a good thing, but if you have too much water moving in, the cell can swell, it can even rupture. So it can actually be bad, very bad, for too much water to move into a cell. Um, the opposite situation is if you have excess sodium in the environment, in the extracellular fluid, and not enough potassium. So this could either be due to a potassium deficiency, which is actually fairly rare, or more likely due to over-consuming sodium, you get more solute on the outside of cells, and what happens is water moves out of the cell into the extracellular fluid, usually into the blood. So um, this is why you're not supposed to drink seawater if you're stranded at sea. If you ever get stranded at sea, remember, don't drink the seawater because there's so much sodium in seawater. Essentially, this is what happens. You actually become very dehydrated. Um, excess sodium consumption can cause dehydration because it causes fluid to leak out of your tissues and into the extracellular fluid into the blood where then it can get ex water can get lost and excreted through urine and you become dehydrated so don't drink the seawater unless you're somehow distilling it first
So you will dehydrate faster than if you didn't drink at all. Okay, so water, our water intakes and our water outputs have to be equal in order to achieve water balance. And there's a few different ways that we gain water and a few different ways that we lose water. So the three different ways that we can uh, intake water or get water into our bodies is um, the major way that we get water is by drinking beverages, whether it be pure water, whether it be juice or milk or soda. Um, all of those are beverages that help to hydrate, that help to provide fluids. So most of, if you were drinking 2,500 mils a day, 1,600 mils would be from, um, I'm trying to find a calculator to get that percentage, but can't do it in my head, let me think. Whatever 16 divided by 25 is. Um, and so most of it is from beverages. From foods, we also get a fair amount, so 700 divided by 25, 100 is like 350, 30, like 35%, right? 700 divided by 25, three and a half, I think it's about 30%. So um, some, a fairly decent proportion of our uh, body fluids come from food. Actually, a lot of foods contain a fair amount of water. The ones that people think of as being sort of obvious a lot of vegetables like cucumbers, watermelon, fruits and vegetables that are very juicy or watery, okay, have very high water content. You actually get a fair amount of water from those foods. Um, but even foods that you think of as being dry, like bread, actually contain a fair amount of water as well. Um, so food and drink contribute a lot of water. And then finally, a very small component of our body water comes from what's called metabolic water as a product of metabolism, of making ATP from our macronutrients, we actually produce water as a byproduct. Just like we produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct, water is another byproduct. So we actually do get a small amount of water from undergoing metabolism of our nutrients. So these are the three ways that we get water. Um, drinks or beverages, food, and metabolic water. There are five different ways that we lose water, okay? Um, most water in our body is lost through urine production. Um, that's how the body gets rid of excess water. It's also how the body gets rid of excess of, of any waste products and excess nutrients, like ex I should say excess minerals. Um, and any other like waste products from the cells like urea from protein breakdown, okay? Um, depending on how hot it is outside, um, or if you're exercising, you can use, lose significant amounts of water through sweat. Um, and there's sort of two kinds of sweat. There's uh, sweat like from actually profusely perspiring, and then there's what we call insensible perspiration. So there's actually, you're actually sort of sweating off water all the time. Like right now, even though it's 50 degrees outside, your body is losing water through your skin, um, through evaporation. And it's so we call that insensible perspiration because you can't sense it. You can't tell that it's happening. Um, expired air by breathing out is another way we lose water. Think about, um, you know, on a cold window and you breathe on the, to make it fog up so that you can draw pictures in it. That's what I used to do in the car when I was little. So um, the reason that it fogs up is because the vapor from your breath is condensing on the cold window. So there's actually vapor, water vapor in your breath. Your lungs are wet. There's water in your tissue. So every time you breathe out, you actually are exhaling small amounts of water and you breathe in and out an awful lot in one day. So it adds up. And then finally, you do lose a little bit of water in feces. Feces are not completely 100% dry and solid. There is a little bit of wetness there. It helps, you know, keep it together. So there is some water lost in feces. So expiration, uh, evaporation or insensible perspiration, sweat, urine, and feces. Those are the five ways that we 
lose water, okay? And if you are getting the same amount of water that you are releasing or excreting, then you are in water balance. Um, so the kidneys are the major organ or major player in terms of water and mineral regulation, okay? So kidneys really regulate our hydration status. They filter out the wastes, so like urea and from protein breakdown and all the minerals, extra minerals that we have floating around. Um, and water then sort of follows because those are all solutes. The waste products and the minerals are, are solutes. So water then also follows them into the waste bucket of the bladder. And, um, and they're all excreted. So that's what urine is. It's excreting mineral waste. And sometimes if you are, uh, particularly if you're dehydrated, if you're not drinking enough water, or you're getting excess amounts of certain minerals, um, the minerals or waste products in your kidney can actually precipitate out, fall out, and form crystals that are called kidney stones. And I don't know if anyone out there has ever had a kidney stone. Luckily, I have never experienced it, but I've heard it's one of the most painful things in the whole world. It's far more painful than childbirth, according to every woman who's ever had a child and had a kidney stone. Um, and essentially you get these little rocks that form in the kidneys and then have to move down the ureter, which is like a teeny tiny little tube. And they're sharp, I mean, they're crystals. They're little, you know, they're craggy. And so they move down and basically scratch their way down the ureter until they come out of the bladder. And they do the same thing through the urethra, that long, uh, the tube that leads from the bladder out of the body. So, not a pleasant experience. Um, to prevent kidney stones, if you are prone to them or if you've had them before, um, one key thing is to stay well hydrated. If you keep enough water in your system, hopefully it keeps all those minerals uh, in solution so they don't precipitate out. So drinking plenty of water is very important for preventing kidney stones. Also avoiding excess mineral consumption, particularly sodium and calcium. Calcium is the major component of most kidney kidney stones. Um, most kidney stones are composed of calcium oxalate, a salt called calcium oxalate. So trying to not to overdo it on calcium, particularly calcium supplements, but also excess sodium can lead to precipitation of um, this calcium oxalate. So those two minerals in particular try to cut back on. So when you get dehydrated, and remember some of the signs of dehydration are you actually get a dry mouth because your saliva sort of dries up because your body doesn't have enough water to produce saliva, okay? That helps to stimulate you to go drink. Um, but some of the hormone regulators of, of hydration um, are antidiuretic hormone, ADH, and aldosterone. Okay, so ADH is produced by the pituitary gland, which is um, just under the hypothalamus, really, which is the part of the brain that regulates uh, hunger and also thirst. But the pituitary gland um, produces ADH, antidiuretic hormone. A diuretic is something that increases fluid loss. So an antidiuretic is against fluid loss. So it promotes fluid retention, okay? So when you become thirsty or dehydrated, antidiuretic hormone is produced, and it signals to the kidney to um, stop getting rid of water. It basically says, hold on to that water. Don't get rid of it. And also, at the same time, the adrenal gland, which sits on top of the kidney, produces a hormone called aldosterone, which signals back to the kidney and says um, to retain sodium, stop getting rid of sodium. Because if you keep sodium in the blood instead of filtering it out into the water, what does water do? It follows sodium. So if you are excreting sodium, if you're fil filtering sodium into the urine, you're going to also be filtering water into the urine and you're going to be um, losing it.
But if you decide if the kidney retains sodium, that'll also in turn increase water retention. So antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone are the two hormones that are involved in uh, regulating dehydration and regulating water in the kidneys. So water adequacy, how much water do you need and what happens if you get too much or too little? This is sort of a general theme with all of the nutrients, but particularly with the vitamins and minerals, we're going to sort of walk through this with each one, the effects of deficiency and the effects of toxicity, if there are any. So the adequate intake for water is 11 cups for women and 15.5 cups for men. Um, that's how much water you should be drinking per day in order to achieve water balance. All right. If you do not get enough water, if you have a water deficiency, it's known as dehydration. And there's different levels of dehydration. So you can have mild dehydration, which is when you lose uh, less than 5% of your body weight. I think actually less than 4% of your body weight. And it just basically causes you to feel thirsty and maybe a little tired, maybe have a headache. Um, but severe dehydration, like if you are doing an Ironman triathlon and you swim two miles and then bike 112 miles or then run a marathon, okay, that's a, a long endurance event and you're going to be sweating a whole lot, okay, so um, people who do those long endurance activities, marathons, triathlons, often lose a lot of body water and have to be really good about staying hydrated during um, the event or they can lose more than 10% of their body weight and it can cause, actually can, can be fatal. And there's a story at the beginning of your chapter about a wrestler who was trying to lose weight quickly and basically was trying to sweat it out and, uh, and died from it. So actually a handful of wrestlers, college wrestlers who died in one year from trying to lose weight quickly by losing water weight and they became very severely dehydrated and also hyperthermic. They essentially died from heat stroke and dehydration. When your body runs out of water, when it becomes very dehydrated, it can't cool, you can't sweat anymore. You lose the ability to sweat and then your body can't cool off efficiently. So um, it gets too hot. Hyperthermia uh, is the opposite of hypothermia. It's overheated. So uh, if you're worried, if you're wondering whether you're dehydrated or not, you're wondering what your hydration status is, and you are not in the middle of a crazy workout because it's a little less, um, you can't, less reliable to do it this way, but uh, on any given day, you can estimate your hydration status by checking your urine, your urine output, both the volume of urine that you produce and the color of your urine. So the darker it is, the more dehydrated you are. So ideally you want your urine to be sort of like a pale yellow color. And there are things that you eat that can change the color of your urine, so it doesn't always work, but, um, but it's a pretty good, you know, guesstimation method. Uh, Water toxicity. Many of you may not be aware that you can, in fact, drink too much water. Um, it's called water intoxication, and it's very rare. It's unlikely that any of you will ever experience water intoxication. Um, it really only happens in two sort of instances. Well, um, patients with kidney problems is one that I'll, I guess, three instances. So one is patients with kidney problems. If your kidneys aren't working properly and you can't filter out water properly, um, then you can have issues with uh, having too much water. Um, also, you can have lots of issues that we'll talk about with having too much, to ha having mineral toxicities as well. But um, really, there's two scenarios where people are at risk of water intoxication. One is endurance athletes, people who are um, sweating a lot. And, re and in sweat, it's not only water that's lost, but salt as well. If you ever taste sweat, it's salty. If you've ever done like a really long race 
at the end, um, you're usually caked, you'll see people there like caked in like this white powder that's actually salt, dried salt on their skin because they're, they sweat and the water evaporates and the salt is left behind, okay? So when you sweat, you lose water, but you also lose salt. So if you're doing an endurance activity, you sweat and you lose water and salt, but you only replace water, then you throw off your electrolyte balance, okay? Let's go back a couple of slides here. What happens if you um, are sweating off all your sodium, so you're running out of sodium and potassium for that matter, and you're only replacing water, you're going to end up in a situation like this, where you have a lot of water and not a lot of electrolytes. And it throws off the balance, and those electrolytes are really important for things like nerve transmission and muscle contraction, particularly in the heart. So um, it can be fatal. Water intoxication can be fatal. So a major occurrence of water intoxication occurs in endurance runners who replace their fluids but don't replace electrolytes. And this used to be a bigger problem and when it started um, becoming a problem in marathons and such where they just provided water at water stops. They now provide at any endurance activity they provide um, like Gatorade or Powerade or some electrolyte replacing fluids in addition to water in order to help prevent uh, water intoxication for athletes. Another scenario where there's been water intoxication are sort of these uh, sort of rare freak occasions where people do drink insane amounts of water in a short amount of time. So one scenario was there was a famous case, and I forget what state it was in. Um, this radio station had a contest. It was hold your Wii for a Wii, like hold your P for a Wii gaming system. And so it was a radio contest, and the contestants had to drink a bunch of water and not go to the bathroom, essentially. And whoever could drink the most water in an hour or something without peeing would win a Wii gaming system. And uh, a woman actually died from the contest. She was actually the second place. She was the runner up. She was trying to win a Wii for her kids. And she drank a bunch of water, didn't win, got home and passed out on the floor. Um, and nobody in, I guess no one was home to call the hospital. She fell into a coma and she died. Um, so it was very sad. The radio station got sued and everyone got fired because, in fact, contestants, people were calling in, nurses, people who um, knew about water intoxication were calling in during this contest and saying, you cannot do this. This is very unsafe. You need to, you know, put an end to this. And they did not because they thought, it's just water. You can't drink too much water, okay? And so that same sentiment has was felt by um, some fraternity brothers at a college, there actually I think there was a couple of instances of this. I can't name the college. Sorry, I'm bad with my specifics and in, in my stories here. Um, but in college fraternities, hazing is a big thing, and a lot of college fraternities get in trouble for hazing using alcohol in under underage drinkers, and also alcohol can consumption can lead to alcohol poisoning which has also led to several deaths in college fraternity issues. So this one college fraternity thought, well, we can't use alcohol, that's bad, we'll get in trouble. We can use water, we can make all the recruits drink a ton of water. In a similar scenario, so it was sort of like a, you know, drink as much water as you can without being contest as a hazing ritual. And uh, one of the recruits died from water intoxication. So if you are just drinking your water, you're 11, trying to go for your 11 cups a day, you carry your water bottle around with you every day and you hydrate as well as you can, you are not going to be in risk of water intoxication. This is like for very extreme scenarios where you're drinking an excessive amount of water in a short amount of time and you're not taking in any salts or any electrolytes. So had those people that in those, you know, that fraternity brother or that woman in the radio contest, had they eaten something salty, it probably wouldn't have been an issue um, as long as the water and salt balances out, but they just kept drinking water, so it diluted the salt in their blood and it caused this water intoxication. 
Okay, so I have a little Nutri case for us to practice with. This is Gustavo, and he says, Something is going on with me this week. Every day at work, I've been feeling weak, like I'm going to be sick to my stomach. It's been really hot, over 100 degrees out in the fields, but I'm used to that. And besides, I've been drinking lots of water. It's probably just my high blood pressure acting up. So what do you think might be wrong with Gustavo? Hopefully you said that it has to do with water, that he might be, he might be dehydrated. Some of you thought, think maybe he's overhydrated. Either one could cause those symptoms of weakness. He says he's drinking lots of water, so maybe he's overhydrating. But it also says that he's, um, it's really hot out and maybe he's, you know, maybe he's not drinking as much water as he needs to be, as he thinks he should, he is. Um, if you learned that he was following a low-sodium diet in order to manage his high blood pressure, would this information argue for or against your theory and why? So if he was following a low-sodium diet, do you think that he is more likely to be experiencing dehydration or overhydration? Hopefully you said overhydration. If he's not getting enough sodium and he's drinking lots of water, then he's probably more at risk for overhydrating. So what do you think he should do differently at work tomorrow in order to feel better and to stay hydrated? A great answer would be for him to drink something with electrolytes in it, like Gatorade instead of water. Um, or to have something... Uh, well, to have something salty with his water, but if he's trying to follow a low-sodium diet, that might not be the best scenario. Whereas Gatorade and um, fluids with electrolytes tend to have a little bit of sodium, but also potassium and other electrolytes, um, that, so they're still fairly low sodium. So uh, those would be good answers, okay? And also to try to stay out of the heat and cool off a little bit would be good too. So when it comes to um, fluids, there are things called diuretics. And a diuretic is any substance that increases our fluid losses. All right. The book mentions that caffeine is a diuretic, which is incorrect. Caffeine can be a diuretic if you drink like very large amounts of it, like we're talking like equivalents of five or six cups of coffee a day. In that case, caffeine can be a diuretic. Also, if you're someone who doesn't consume caffeine on a regular basis and you have a cup of coffee, again, caffeine can have a diuretic effect. It can cause you to produce more urine. Um, but for most people, caffeine is not a diuretic, not a diuretic, okay? So if the program's asking you about it, fine, you have to answer with what the book says. But if on the test I ask you about it, the answer is caffeine is not a diuretic except in excessive amounts. Um, one thing that is a diuretic, clearly a diuretic, is alcohol. Alcohol is a diuretic. It actually blocks the effects of ADH, of antidiuretic hormone. So that's why when you drink alcohol, if you drink alcohol, um, you often have to pee a lot uh, because alcohol is a diuretic. It's also most likely why you get hangovers from alcohol as well. A lot of the symptoms of hangovers are symptoms of dehydration. Um, so the headache, the nausea, all of those things can be, uh, well, some people think that they can be completely chalked up to dehydration. But surely, um, but definitely a lot of people would tell you if you drink water, make sure you stay hydrated while you're drinking alcohol, you will have far better consequences the next day, less dehydration. And then finally, a lot of um, water, a lot, sorry, a lot of weight loss drugs, like over-the-counter weight loss medications, are actually just diuretics. They cause you to pee a lot more, so you lose water weight. You lose a couple of pounds of water weight, um, and they're not particularly safe 
because they can lead to dehydration. So, um, you know, if you buy some kind of, if you take some kind of over-the-counter uh, diet pill, make sure you read the ingredients, read how it works. Um, some of them say clearly that they are meant to eliminate water weight, but some of them don't say it quite so clearly on the box. And if the ingredients say that they are diuretics, then you know that you're just losing water weight and not actually any body fat or tissue. Um, so alcohol, talking about alcohol as a diuretic. Now let's uh, talk a little bit more about alcohol as, I was going to say as a nutrient, as a non-nutrient really. So this is where we're jumping back to chapter 6 for a minute. So um, alcohol is ethanol essentially and it is contained in beverages that are made from fermented grains or fermented fruits, so beer, wine, spirits. And it actually does provide energy to the body. It actually does provide calories. We break it down, and we can use it to make ATP, just like the macronutrients. However, alcohol is not considered a nutrient because it's not necessary for our body's function. In fact, it can be very harmful to our body's function. So even though it provides us with energy and calories, we don't consider it a nutrient. But it does contain calories. It contains seven calories per gram. So it's actually more nutrient dense, or sorry, more energy dense, provides more calories than carbs and proteins. Um, so one alcoholic beverage, is defined as any amount of, a, of an alcoholic beverage that contains a half fluid ounce of pure alcohol. So um, beer is ranges anywhere from about 4% alcohol to like 10% alcohol for a really strong microbrew. Okay, so beers are, have a very small percentage of alcohol in them, so 12 fluid ounces of beer is considered um, a half fluid ounce of total of pure alcohol. About five fluid ounces of wine and about one and a half ounces or a shot of liquor. Um, all are considered to be one alcoholic beverage. Okay? So the body processes alcohol in the liver. Liver is, is the sort of key player in detoxifying alcohol, and the average person's liver detoxifies alcohol at a rate of approximately one drink per hour. So if you are wanting to drink without getting drunk, you should be drinking approximately one drink per hour. Now there's different things that can, you know, cause differences in the rate of alcohol processing. Um, your age, your body size, your weight, your body composition, um, your how often you drink, the more often you drink, the more efficient your liver can become. Um, also how recently you ate. Food can slow alcohol absorption. Alcohol is absorbed directly uh, from the stomach. Actually, it doesn't have to be digested. It can get uh, directly absorbed from the stomach. Um, so if you have the more food you have in the stomach, the slower the absorption is. So Alcohol, ethanol, gets detoxified in a two-step process. The first, there's two enzymes in the process, alcohol dehydrogenase and acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So alcohol dehydrogenase turns ethanol into acetaldehyde, which is a very toxic substance and can do a lot of liver damage and is actually what causes liver damage in chronic alcohol abusers. Um, Acetaldehyde dehydrogenase then converts this acetaldehyde into a comp compound called acetyl-CoA, which can be metabolized to make ATP, um, or it can be converted to fatty acids and stored as fat, either in the liver or elsewhere in the body. So um, this is what how, how alcohol is metabolized in the liver. And there's a you know, certain rate that the liver can do this metabolism. So if you have more ethanol or alcohol in your system than your liver can detoxify at one time, then that extra alcohol gets sort of sent out and released into the blood and is, flows through the blood 
and gets excreted into other bodily fluids as well, like urine, sweat, and your breath, which is how a breathalyzer test works. Um, so the more alcohol you drink, the higher your blood alcohol concentration is. And that blood alcohol concentration is also known as the BAC, B-A-C. And there are legal limits when it comes to driving. The legal driving limit for uh, your blood alcohol level to be is 0.08%. And I found this nifty chart online that helps you guesstimate what your blood alcohol level would be depending on your weight and how many drinks you've had. So um, if you weigh, you know, 120 pounds, it takes about three drinks to put you over the legal limit. And um, this chart here is from your book that kind of goes over the, the uh, mental effects that are the effects that alcohol has on the brain and on coordination and um, etc. after you've drank, after your blood alcohol level reaches certain levels. So from 0.02 to 0.06, you start having a more positive mood, you feel less inhibited, you feel relaxed. These are sort of the usual, the usual desired effects that alcohol has. Alcohol is a depressant. So it makes you sort of feel more relaxed. It depresses things. From 0.06 to 0.08, you start having some maybe some speech impairments, some vision impairments, some um, impaired decision making. Beyond 0.08, you start having reduction in motor skills, things that can really impair your driving, which is why that's set at the legal limit. Though I also found um, a chart online showing you how even at below 0.08, uh, I mean, vision impairment here, impaired decision-making, that can still impair your driving skills. So um, not a good idea to, to drink and drive, even if your BAC is less than 0.08. Um, and then as your blood alcohol level gets really high, 0.35 is extremely high. That's literally saying a third of your blood is alcohol, is ethanol, um, which can lead to loss of consciousness and death. Um, and 0.3 to 0.35 is you're basically barely alive. You're barely functioning um, in that state. So um, different types of excessive alcohol consumption. Some definitions, I guess. Binge drinking is consuming five or more drinks on one occasion. It's the definition of binge drinking. I think for females it's actually four or more drinks, and males, it's five or more drinks, is the definition of binge drinking. So drinking to get drunk. Um, except, like, binge drinking a lot can lead to, um, can lead to alcohol poisoning, okay, which is consumption that overwhelms the liver's ability to detoxify and can lead to coma or death. And alcohol dependence in alcohol abuse are people who drink, chronically drink, chronically abuse alcohol, and uh, feel this uncontrollable need to drink. They can develop a tolerance to alcohol, meaning that their body learns to metabolize it better, though I did have one student who corrected me one semester who took a, a class, I don't remember what class it was, but um, that it's not actually the body, the body doesn't actually metabolize it faster, but the brain becomes less sensitive to it so that all of these sort of mental effects it takes more alcohol to have to feel those that positive mood or that relaxation um, and chronic alcohol ab abuse can cause serious damage to the liver so this is a normal liver on the left here a fatty liver and a liver with cirrhosis a ton of cirrhosis okay so the fatty liver is sort of the first stage because remember, excess acetyl-CoA, okay, this can be metabolized and stored as fat. It can be stored as fat right there in the liver. So if you're doing a lot of alcohol breakdown, you can end up with a fatty liver. And if you're really stressing your liver out by causing it to just be on constant alcohol breakdown, the liver gets sick and overworked and starts forming all this scar tissue, which is what cirrhosis is. 
okay? So there's, alcohol isn't all bad. It's not like um, a toxin. It's something that, like anything and everything in the diet, should be consumed in moderation. And there's actually um, some suspected health benefits to engaging in or partaking in light to moderate alcohol consumption. So that would be one drink a day for women, two drinks a day for men is considered moderate alcohol consumption. Um, so drinking moderate alcohol, alcohol um, can lead to improved lipid profile, so higher HDL, lower LDL cholesterol. It can reduce the risk of blood clots. Alcohol is actually a blood thinner, so it can um, reduce the risk of blood clots, and blood clots can cause heart attack and stroke. Remember, we talked about that with cardiovascular disease, the effect, what blood clots can do if they get lodged in the wrong place. It can also stimulate appetite. Um, it's particularly helpful in the elderly or sick um, people who are not who do not have much appetite and therefore are not getting proper nutrition because of improper appetite. Um, it, can, it, po it can also possibly lower the risk of uh, forms of dementia, um, particularly red wine. Some of the components of red wine have been shown to do that, the antioxidants in them. So probably not the alcohol itself. But anyway, there are some positive benefits. Also, so there's psychological benefits. Um, alcohol helps improve mood and induce relaxation. And these are things that can help lower stress. And stress can cause a lot of bad things to happen. <laughs> um, it can increase your risk for cancer, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, to name a few. So... There's also a lot of downsides to alcohol consumption, but mostly to moderate to heavy alcohol consumption. So if you drink too much alcohol, there are a lot of health benefits. I mean, if you're a chronic alcohol abuser, we know about that, liver cirrhosis. Um, but even moderate to heavy consumption, that's not quite, maybe not quite alcohol abuse, but um, it can increase your risk for cancer, it can increase your risk for hypertension, so a little bit of alcohol can reduce um, blood clots, and a lot of alcohol can actually increase your risk for hypertension. It increases your total calorie intake, so it can increase weight gain. And it reduces absorption of some of the B vitamins. We talked about that, the B vitamins that um, are alcohol, alcoholics are at risk for being deficient in. And also alcohol can interact with medications that you take, whether they be over-the-counter or prescription. So it's always good if you're taking medications to make sure that you double-check and see if it's safe to drink alcohol with them. And last but not least in terms of alcohol is uh, the danger of drinking alcohol when you are pregnant. So pregnant women who drink alcohol are risking having babies who have a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Okay, so it's a spectrum of disorders that are basically different birth defects um, if mothers abuse alcohol during pregnancy. So it can lead to these children have, they suffer from a, a variety of different issues, emotional, social, developmental uh, deficiencies, and really severe fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is called fetal alcohol syndrome. And there's a number of sort of different facial features that are indicative of fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, some of them are having a very flat, thin upper lip and having no midline groove. That's that little like place above your lip where you can like stick your finger. There's like a groove there. Um, they don't really have one of those. Their uh, knees, the bridge of their nose is very flat and wide. Um, these are just some characteristic face, facial features. They also have a number of emotional, behavioral, social, learning, and developmental problems. Um, very sad, actually. So that is all I'm going to say about fluids, both water and alcohol. Now this brings us back to the minerals, our other micronutrient, aside from vitamins, vitamins and minerals. 
Minerals are very different from vitamins in terms of their structure, but they're very similar in some ways to some of their functions. Then so we'll get to that. And they oftentimes work, work together in similar processes. So minerals are, essentially minerals come from the earth. They come from the soil that our food is grown in. That's where minerals come from. When you think minerals, you think inorganic rocks and soil, okay? Um, that's the same minerals that we're talking about in our body. They come from the periodic table of elements. Minerals are elements. They're inorganic, meaning they don't contain carbon. They are literally elements off the periodic table. Elements cannot be broken down. We don't digest minerals, okay? We just absorb them and excrete them and, and use them, incorporate them into different um, molecules. But we don't digest minerals because they are the simplest type of, mole of, of chemical there is. They're elements. And most of the minerals in our body um, can carry an electrical charge. They form ions. And that, since they can carry an electrical charge, we call them electrolytes. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about fluid and electrolytes. Electrolytes, we're referring to our minerals. And there's a couple of key minerals that have um, particularly important functions as electrolytes. So the minerals can be divided into two groups, the major minerals and the trace minerals. And then I guess there's the ultra trace minerals or the possible essential mineral group, which I'm not going to talk about at all and you're not responsible for, for the test. It's only like two pages in the chapter that talks about these guys. So remember with vitamins, we had the fat soluble vitamins and the water soluble vitamins. Okay, that was like the two groups of vitamins. So the two groups of minerals are the major minerals and the trace minerals. So the difference here is for the vitamins, I do expect you to memorize and know which vitamins are fat soluble and which are water soluble. For minerals, I do not, uh, I'm not gonna ask you on the test which ones are major minerals, which ones are trace minerals. Though I have a feeling the flashcards on the Connect program probably ask you that. Um, but I'm not going to ask you to memorize which are major and which are trace. But we will talk about all of these different minerals. Um, I scratch that. We're not going to talk about all of them because your book, unfortunately, but conveniently for you, leaves out several of them, of discussion of several of them, which kind of pisses me off about your book. Oh, but alas, I chose it. I made my bed, so now I have to sleep in it. Chloride is one that the book does not, it completely neglects to talk about. Same with sulfur. Um, and both of those I could give or take, so I don't really mind so much. The one that I'm mad about that it doesn't talk about is fluoride. This is all it says about fluoride. But I do want you to know this, even though it's a tiny little blurb in your book. You might want to highlight it because... I might ask you something about it on a test. I haven't written it yet, but um, fluoride is technically not an essential nutrient. If we don't get fluoride, if you don't have fluoride, you essentially become more susceptible to cavities. Fluoride is very helpful in building strong teeth and um, preventing cavities, which is why you get fluoride treatments at the dentist, why you brush your teeth with toothpaste that has fluoride in it, and why most water in the United States is actually, most tap water is um, supplemented with fluoride or treated with fluoride. So most places you go in the U.S., you get a glass of water out of the sink and there's actually small amounts of fluoride in it. That's to help our teeth be strong and healthy. And in regions like, I know in Saranac Lake, the water is not fluoridated. And at the, I think students have told me that their schools actually do fluoride. They, they, they did fluoride rinses at school, like once a week or once a month. Um, the nurse comes in and they all have to like swish fluoride rinse in their mouths. Um, so you cannot, you can actually, if, well, you, you can overdose on fluoride or you can have fluoride toxicity if you take if you ingest too much fluoride in terms of fluoride pills, because that's another thing that people in areas where there's no fluoridated water, a lot of times doctors will prescribe fluoride supplements for children to help protect their teeth. 
And if they take too much, um, ingest too much of it orally, then it can cause fluorosis, which is like a discoloration of the teeth. Um, that's totally reversible. But if you um, just swish it around in your mouth, if you use a fluoride rinse, that's safe to use every day. You don't get fluorosis from that. It's just if you ingest it that it causes that. So uh, that's interesting for you. Fluoride, important for teeth and bones, important for preventing cavities. Oh, okay. So our minerals have a lot of different functions in our bodies. And there's a nice picture in your book that I sort of edited a little bit here to show you the different functions sort of that you can classify minerals in. And notice that several of them fall into, into many, have many functions, okay? So for example, calcium is very important for bone health. We all know that calcium is important for our bones. All right, but it's also important for muscle contraction. It's also important for transmission of nerve impulses. It's also important for cellular metabolism and for blood formation and clotting and for growth and development. So. Um, the minerals kind of moonlight. They have mul multiple jobs. Um, so there's a lot of sources of minerals in our diet. Most foods that we eat contain at least some small amounts of minerals. And um, the thing about minerals, along with vitamins, is that there's sort of a limited bioavailability when it comes to by, when it comes to our micronutrients. Macronutrients, when we eat foods, we pretty much get all of the carbohydrates, all of the fats, all of the proteins out of that food that we can, with the exception of fiber. We don't digest fiber. But when it comes to vitamins and minerals, we can only absorb a portion of the vitamins and minerals in our food. And that ability of the body, or the limited ability of the body to absorb micronutrients is called bioavailability. So the bioavailability of a nutrient is referring to how well the body can actually absorb that nutrient um, in our intestines. So um, we'll talk about the different nutrients and some of their bioavailabilities, or the book does. I don't really discuss them in terms of their numbers, but in general, most minerals are not 100% absorbable. You don't absorb 100% of the calcium in milk. You absorb maybe 30% of it. In different um, states of development, for instance, pr during pregnancy, you actually absorb a lot. It actually increases your bioavailability. Something about the hormones during pregnancy increase the bioavailability of a number of substances, including calcium. But we'll talk about that more in... Um, the life cycle, sort of nutrition in the life cycle chapter. In general, these are just some general comments about minerals on this slide. So generally, the more processed a food is, the fewer minerals it's going to have, with the exception of sodium. So as you process foods, usually you lose the mineral content, and some of them might be added back. So for example, when you're refining carbohydrates, when you're refining flour, and you strip off all that bran, and you strip out the germ, so you get this nice white fluffy flour, and then you enrich it, so you add back some vitamins. You also can add back minerals, like iron is added back. Um, but a lot of minerals are, are not added back and are missing. So the more processed a food is, the lower its mineral content, as a general rule. Um, some other sources of minerals besides food include tap water, or mineral water, which do contain small amounts of various minerals. Already talked about fluoride being a component of tap water, also chloride, sodium can sometimes be, calcium can be, um, so sm in small amounts. And then also dietary supplements can be sources of minerals, just like they're sources of vitamins. So they're usually not absorbed as well, and depending on the mineral, but they can be a source of minerals. So remember we said minerals are divided into two groups. There's the trace, the major minerals and the trace minerals. So the major minerals, and I like these tables in your book. These are a really good 
resource for studying as you're trying to keep all of the minerals and um, straight. It's really good uh, table that has it, you know, names the mineral, what the major functions of that mineral are, uh, what the adequate amounts and the upper limits are, and what the major deficiency and toxicity symptoms are. So really good, helpful charts to study from. But these are the major minerals. Again, you don't have to memorize them. Calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, chloride, and sulfur. All right, so the first one we'll talk about, the most major mineral in the body is calcium. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body because of its role in forming bones. Bones are primarily composed of calcium phosphate. Um, that the hard, the hard part of the bone is all calcium phosphate. So uh, there's a huge amount of calcium in your body, in your bones. And I think it's about 90% of the calcium in your body is found in your bones. So that's, you know, like sort of the key role for calcium. But it's not the only role for calcium. It's, um, it's important in terms of your bones and teeth. But it also assists with blood clotting. It also is important for transmission of nerve impulses and for muscle contraction. So here's my little hybrid picture of it's important in your bones and teeth, but also important for your muscles, for muscle contraction. So calcium is regulated by two glands, your thyroid gland and your parathyroid glands. So your thyroid gland is in your neck. It's butterfly shaped and it's in your neck and um, it releases a hormone called calcitonin, all right? And calcitonin, if calcium levels are very high, calcitonin is released and it causes um, calcium deposition in the bones. So if blood calcium levels are high, that means let's store some in the bones and it means we don't need to absorb any more calcium from the intestine, so let's stop uptaking calcium. And it also uh, increases calcium um, excretion from the kidneys. So it decreases reabsorption, meaning it increases excretion. Okay, so the thyroid gland helps to lower ca blood calcium levels when they're high, but when blood calcium levels are low, you get the parathyroid glands secreting a hormone called parathyroid hormone, PTH, parathyroid hormone. And the parathyroid glands, by the way, are these four little dots. They're four small glands that are on the back side of the thyroid. So you have the thyroid here in your neck. It's butterfly shaped. You take it off. You turn it around. There's the parathyroid glands. Okay, so when calcium levels are too low, parathyroid secretes parathyroid hormone which increases calcium, uh, sorry, calcium release from the bones. It increases calcium absorption from the intestines, and it increases calcium reabsorption in the kidneys. So, the kid, so it tells the kidneys, don't get rid of it. We need it. Let's keep it here. So all of these, these two sort of pathways, kind of like insulin and glucagon, they work antagonistically to help balance and keep a homeostasis of calcium, just like insulin and glucagon, which are both made by the pancreas, work together to maintain glucose homeostasis. Okay, so our bone health is uh, pretty important, and calcium is pretty important in bone health, along with vitamin D, if you remember that one. And um, our bones are actually what's the word? They're maintained. So um, your bones aren't just, they don't just form and then stay that way for your li whole life. Your bone tissue gets, uh, you know, gets weakened, it gets used and gets old. And you have these special bone cells in the blood, that, or sorry, in the bone that um, break down old uh, and weak bone tissue, and then these other cells that build up new, stronger tissue. So your bones are constantly being remodeled. That's the word I was looking for um, throughout your life. So these cells, these special cells that are involved in breakdown of old bone tissue are called osteoclasts, and the cells that are involved in forming new bone tissue are called osteoblasts. 
So here's the osteoblast, and then here, this little moon-shaped thing under here, is the new bone that they have formed, okay? After the osteoclasts ate away at that bone, the osteoblast came and rebuilt it, okay? So ideally, you want to reach your peak bone density. So your, your peak bone density is reached really before the age of 30. So by the time you're 30, there's really not a whole lot you can do to increase your bone health. I mean, you can stave off osteoporosis by doing some things, but you can't build your bones up any thicker at that point. So when you're young, that is the time to really focus on your bone health and to build your bones to the maximum bone density that you can. Because what happens is, when you're younger, your osteoblasts are much more active and they do a lot more bone building. But as you get older, particularly after the age of 40, your osteoclasts start to take over. Your osteoclasts become more active than your osteoblasts, so you get more bone breakdown than you do bone buildup. So um, there are certain things you can do to try to uh, slow down that bone breakdown, but if you don't, it can result in osteoporosis, which we'll talk about in a second. So calcium is a major way that we can help to take care of our bones because, again, they're made up of calcium phosphate. And good sources of calcium are dairy and dark leafy green vegetables. But there's pretty much, uh, there's calcium that can be found in various different types of foods from my plate, okay? So the major sources are dairy, so milk, cheese, yogurt and green leafy vegetables. So green leafy vegetables, the calcium in green leafy vegetables is less bioavailable than that in dairy, so you absorb less of the calcium in spinach and broccoli than you do in, in, in milk. And because of other phytochemicals that bind up the calcium and prevent you from being able to absorb it. Um, those phytochemicals are phytic acid and oxalic acid, okay? They're just other plant chemicals that bind the calcium. And you'll see that's kind of a recurring theme in when we're talking about minerals. That minerals are better absorbed in general from, from animal products, animal foods, meat and dairy uh, and eggs than they are from plants, even though plants are a very good source of minerals. Um, another thing to remember is that vitamin D enhances calcium absorption. So if you're trying to get a lot more calcium, the more things that you eat with vitamin D, the more vitamin D you're getting, the more calcium you're going to um, be able to absorb. So again, in the summertime, when you're making vitamin D from sun exposure, you are probably absorbing more calcium than in the wintertime if you're not getting vitamin D from your diet, especially, and you're not getting sunlight anymore, you won't absorb calcium as well. So these other food groups you can find for in, in fruits. There's really no calcium in fruits, but in there's a lot of calcium-fortified orange juice out there now. Um, you can have calcium-fortified grains, calcium-fortified cereals. And in some of the protein foods, a lot of the soy protein foods like tofu, tempeh, are all, they're a meat substitute, so a lot of them have, are fortified with uh, calcium. Um, almonds are a good source of calcium, and, and bo uh, bony fish, because the bones have calcium, so sp salmon or um, sardines or whatever, any fish that has bones, the bones still in it. Calcium, when it comes to calcium adequacy, the RDA for calcium, and you don't have to memorize any of these numbers, but it gives context when we're talking about it. So the recommended dietary allowance for calcium, so the sort of average amount that you should get in your diet, is about 1,000 milligrams a day. 1,000 for women, 1,200 for men. And the upper limit is anywhere from 2,000 to 2,500 milligrams per day. So notice that's not a big difference. That's basically like if you're getting twice as much as the RDA, you're getting too much. You're at risk of getting too much. So with the minerals, that safe zone, that sort of optimal zone, that optimal range is pretty small. 
Um, so you don't want to get more than uh, about 2,500 milligrams per day or you're at risk for toxicity. Well, what are the toxicity effects of too much calcium? It can cause hypercalcemia, having too much calcium in the blood. And one of the major side effects of that or risky side effects of that is increased risk for kidney stones, which we talked about in the beginning, um, are usually composed of calcium oxalate. So having too much calcium in your diet, in fact, it's really having too much calcium from supplements. They've actually done studies and compared a high calcium diet from food like milk and green vegetables versus a high calcium diet from supplements. And having a high calcium diet in terms of food actually reduces your risk of kidney stones, whereas taking calcium supplements increases your risk of kidney stones. So if you've had kidney stones before, try to avoid calcium supplements. And calcium supplements in even include Tums. Tums are calcium, Tums are an antacid. They're advertised as an antacid, but they're composed of a chemical called calcium carbonate. So they actually contribute a lot of calcium. Um, so if you are prone to kidney stones and heartburn, don't choose Tums as your antacid. Use a different antacid that doesn't have calcium in it. Um, okay, so there, but there's a whole bunch of different types of calcium supplements. And those can be very good if you are at risk of calcium deficiency. So who's at risk for calcium deficiency? People who are vegetarians and don't drink milk. Um, they can still get calcium from vegetables, but they have to make sure they're eating a variety and that they're eating lots of them because remember calcium is less bioavailable from vegetables. Um, also, so calcium deficiency, the, the risk of that is that it increases your risk for osteoporosis. It can decrease your bone density. So it can increase your risk for osteoporosis. What is osteoporosis? It literally means a condition of porous bones. Porous meaning having lots of holes. So if you look at the spongy tissue of bones, all right, this is a normal bone, and this one is a osteoporotic bone, okay? Notice it's more holy, there's more holes. It looks more sort of rotted away. And that's what osteoporosis is. It's sort of a loss of bone mass. And um, it can lead to that loss of bone mass. Essentially, so all these, it looks, the sponginess looks kind of um, like it's not very strong. But if our bones were completely solid, we would be way too heavy to move around. You need to have this sort of, these air spaces in order to make bones a little bit lighter. But having all these little branches and things actually acts like scaffolding in the bone so it strengthens it and when you lose that scaffolding the bone becomes weaker and more easily prone to fractures and um, also the bone can become compacted so if particularly the bones of the spine so a normal person has a spine that's I mean it's slightly curved but you know kind of straight and with osteoporosis the bones get kind of compressed and they cave under buckle under pressure a little and you get this sort of hunchback curved back um, sort of look so osteoporosis is not reversible um, and there's a lot of things that are risk factors aside from calcium um, Intake. So calcium is not the only factor in developing osteoporosis. It's, it's potentially one factor. So the risk factors for osteoporosis include age. As you get older, you are at increased risk for osteoporosis. Gender. Females are more at risk for osteoporosis. It has to do with estrogen and estrogen's effect on calcium deposition. Um or really the lack thereof, because as women get older, their estrogen production goes down, and so it's the loss of estrogen in older age. Um, genetics, if your mother or father suffers from osteoporosis, you are more likely to suffer from it. Nutrition, that's where calcium and vitamin D come in and play a role. 
Physical activity, low physical activity is really a risk factor. Um, physical activity, particularly weight-bearing activities, actually build bone density, build bone mass. So physical activity, when we get to that chapter, we talk about it, how it's important for your bones. And then smoking. Smoking increases your risk for osteoporosis. So if you want to reduce your risk of osteoporosis, things that you can do that you can manipulate are your nutrition, your diet, making sure you're getting adequate calcium intake and adequate vitamin D intake, that you are undergoing regular weight-bearing exercise so that you're getting that physical activity that helps build and strengthen your bones. And also there are some medications that can sl slow down um, bone breakdown and, and slow the progression of osteoporosis. So that was calcium, and it's particularly important for bones. The next uh, pretty important nutrient is sodium. The next major, major mineral is sodium. And sodium has this bad reputation, whereas we're going to talk about how it can lead to hypertension. And we have a lot of sodium in our American diet that um, has, has probably contributed to hypertension in some way. But sodium is actually a very important nutrient. It's important for fluid balance. And inter that whole thing about water intoxication essentially is... If you, if you drink too much water, you dilute the sodium in your blood, and that can be fatal. So having a completely sodium-free diet is not good. It's just that um, we, as Americans, have way too much sodium in our diet, and it causes problems. So sodium is an important, necessary nutrient. Do we overdo it? Yes, we do. Um, its most important role is in fluid balance, fluid and electrolyte balance. So I showed this slide before. Um, sodium, if you have too much sodium outside of the cell, water moves out of the cell into the extracellular fluid. And if we think of this extracellular fluid as the blood, okay, which usually it is, um, we can see how sodium regulates blood pressure. So you increase your sodium, you're going to increase the amount of water in your blood. And um, if you increase water in your blood, you increase your blood volume and you increase your blood pressure. So increasing sodium increases blood volume and blood pressure. That's how sodium regulates blood pressure. It, the more sodium, the higher your blood pressure, sort of. So the other important roles of sodium are, sodium is also very important for nerve impulse transmission and for muscle contraction and whenever you see these two things together you should also think heart because your heart is a muscle that depends on nerve transmissions that signal the pacemaker of your heart to beat okay so in nerve transmission and muscle contraction kind of go hand in hand your muscles contract when the nerves tell it to and sodium is very important for that um, in all muscles not just your heart but uh, and sodium also assists in the transport of glucose into body cells. So those glucose transporters in your cells don't work alone. They actually need sodium to help them uh, function. So sodium has a lot of important roles. It's not all bad, but we overdo it, and that's why um, we talk about it as sort of a bad thing. So where, do so where does sodium come from in our diet? What are the sources of sodium? Most sodium in our diet comes from processed food or restaurant foods. Okay, so anything packaged, anything that comes in a package, typically high in sodium. Particularly some of the major ones that I have lit, written here. Um, meats, deli meats, packaged meats, pre-cooked meats, okay, very high in sodium. We're talking like one serving has 30% of your daily needs of sodium. Um... Same thing with canned soup. Again, one can of soup might provide, oh, two-thirds of your daily needs of sodium in one can of soup, okay? And also frozen dinners, like TV dinners, frozen, uh, any kind of frozen meal, frozen pizza, frozen, like, hot pockets, okay? All of those are very high in sodium. 
because um, sodium is added to all of those things as a preservative to preserve it to keep it from spoiling so that you can buy these pre-made things um, but they're very high in sodium the other sort of obvious thing is any kind of salty snack so pretzels chips peanuts things like that are all typically high in sodium so most of the sodium in our diets comes from the processed foods that we eat we eat a lot of processed foods in America um, there's some that comes from uh, food that we salt that we add either while cooking or while at the table just using the salt shaker to add salt to your food at the table okay so that's actually a small percentage only about six percent of the salt in our diet actually comes from salt that we add at the table with the salt shaker um, and then there is actually sodium you have to remember is a mineral comes from the earth comes from soil so produce that's grown in sodium containing soil does contain small amounts of sodium so about 12 percent of the sodium in our diet comes is naturally occurring like um, a food that's I guess somewhat famous is, is celery you have celery salt ever heard of celery salt because celery if you taste it it's, it's actually a little bit salty there's actually a fair amount of sodium uh, in celery but not nearly as much as you would find in any kind of processed foods okay so these are the sources a pie graph showing you the sources of sodium in the typical American diet um, so the recommended amount or the adequate intake amount the AI for sodium is 1500 milligrams per day okay the body actually needs far less than that so this is a cool little chart I found on the CDC website that the, the body really only needs about 180 to 500 milligrams of sodium to get by and not to have a sodium deficiency. Um, but the adequate intake level is set at 1500 milligrams per day. So more than enough to uh, meet the minimum recommended amounts. The upper intake level is 2300 milligrams a day that's less than twice as much as the AI so again pretty narrow range that we're sticking in here that's okay um, the average American person to age two and up is intaking about 3400 milligrams per day so that's more than a thousand milligrams over the tolerable upper intake level so we as Americans do have a bit of a problem with sodium so as you are doing your diet analysis looking over your your intakes of minerals for your diet analysis look at your sodium intake if it's high that is actually pretty normal for Americans if it's not high good for you good job um, so sodium deficiency not really an issue in the United States um, but usually if it occurs it's from um, excessive sweating or excessive loss of fluids through vomiting or diarrhea which can cause electrolyte imbalance fluid loss you're losing fluids and electrolytes mainly sodium and potassium so that's where you can have a sodium deficiency sodium toxicity is what we probably all do um, on a regular basis by in consuming too much sodium and it can increase your risk for hypertension so sodium does not cause hypertension uh, it's on this slide here sodium does not cause hypertension if you eat too much sodium you are not 100 percent going to develop hypertension you might develop hypertension there is a correlation between high sodium intake and high blood pressure hypertension is just a fancy word for high blood pressure okay so also people who have hypertension if they reduce their sodium intake they usually are pretty successful at reducing their blood pressure so there's a lot of risk factors for hypertension not just sodium consumption but family history your age obesity physical inactivity smoking also um, African Americans suffer from hypertension more than other ethnic populations in the US so that can increase your risk um, and the sort of uh, numbers if you know your 
blood pressure, okay? Normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, so there's systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So it's one number over another, so um, it's systolic over diastolic. So normal blood pressure is 120 over 80 or lower than that. And then hypertension is anything that's over 140 systolic or over 90 diastolic. And then there's this middle ground, the prehypertension, which is a little higher than normal, but not so high that we call it hypertension. So you don't have to know those numbers, but if you were curious for yourself, because I think like most um, drugstores like Walgreens and Rite Aid and stuff have like a free blood pressure cuff that you can go in and take your blood pressure. Uh, so that might be fun for you to do now that you're learning about it and see whether your blood pressure falls into one of these categories if you didn't know already. Um, so there's diets. There's a, there's a diet called the DASH diet, which DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And this is like the new and uh, current um, heart-healthy diet to be on to prevent cardiovascular disease, to reduce hypertension and prevent cardiovascular disease. And it's basically low in sodium to reduce hypertension and low in saturated fat and cholesterol to promote healthy blood lipid levels. And it's high in fruits and vegetables and low fat uh, dairy products. So that is sodium. Sodium is very important for fluid balance, but so is potassium. Potassium is another major mineral that's important for fluid balance. Because remember, potassium is the mineral that's found inside of cells in the intracellular fluid. So potassium, when potassium is high and sodium is low, and sodium is low, water moves into cells. So it moves out of the blood and into cells. So we're reducing the amount of water in blood. We're reducing the blood volume. We're bringing down blood pressure. So potassium, sodium tends to increase blood pressure. Increasing potassium decreases your blood pressure. Okay, that's important to get straight. Um, so as an electrolyte, potassium is also very important for nerve impulse transmission and muscle contraction. And therefore, let's think the heart. Okay. Um, sources of potassium are mainly... Fresh fruits and vegetables are a really good source of potassium. You also have decent sources of potassium in dairy foods and whole grains and beans and meat. So a lot of foods contain potassium. Fresh foods is the key. When it comes to potassium, you're looking for fresh and not processed. The more processed a food is, the lower it's going to be in potassium and the higher it's going to be in sodium. So I like this chart I got somewhere online. So you take these different foods, milk, meat, vegetables, fruits, grains, these different food groups, okay? And we look at unprocessed examples. So you have a glass of milk. Unprocessed is just milk from a cow. I mean, maybe it's been pasteurized. Um, but you take that milk and you process it and you make some kind of milk product like Jello, okay, which is has, uh, you know, powdered milk in it. But this... Um, the yellow represents sodium and the pink represents potassium. So there's far more potassium in milk than there is in the processed product Jello. Same thing here, let's go with the fruits. So you've got a fresh peach, which is almost entirely potassium and no sodium. There's pretty much no sodium in a fresh peach. But you process that peach and you make peach pie, suddenly you hardly have any potassium left and there's a ton of sodium because you've processed it into this pie. So the more processed a food is, the higher the sodium and the lower the potassium. So eating fresh fruits has the dual benefit of increasing your potassium, which is good, it lowers your blood pressure, and it decreases your sodium intake, which also will help lower your blood pressure. So the adequate intake amount for potassium is 4,700 milligrams per day. And most Americans only consume about 2,500 milligrams per day. So let's think about that effect on our blood pressure. We're talking we get more than the up tolerable upper limit for sodium, and we get less than the recommended amount of potassium. Well, we're really kind of fucking our, our blood pressure, right? Because 
Sodium raises blood pressure, and we eat too much of it. And potassium, which would help lower our blood pressure, we don't get enough of. So uh, if you have high blood pressure, you really want to try to knock down your sodium intake. But if that really kills you to have to cut out foods that are high in sodium, try to increase your potassium intake because potassium balances out sodium. So really you want to try to get a balance there. So when you're looking at your diet, your um, your bar graph report and you're looking at and you're, you're analyzing your mineral intakes and you're looking at your sodium and you're looking at your potassium you know are they equivalent are you getting far more of one than you are of the other or are you getting roughly equal amounts in terms of your um, daily value so like if you're getting when uh, 80 percent of your needs of sodium are you also getting 80 percent of your needs of potassium because um, if you're getting 80% of your needs of sodium, you're not getting too much sodium, but if you're only getting 20% of your needs of potassium, you could still be at risk for hypertension because your potassium intake is very low. Um, so that's a little digression there. So anyway, potassium deficiency, like actual deficiency, even though most Americans don't get the recommended amount, most of them don't suffer from true deficiency. Um, really potassium deficiency occurs again similar to sodium deficiency from um, excessive fluid and electrolyte loss either through sweating, vomiting, or diarrhea. Also kidney disease can result in potassium deficiency so an inability to reabsorb uh, pot potassium from the waste. Potassium toxicity does not there's no upper limit for potassium, so there's really no such thing as potassium uh, toxicity, because most, especially from food, most people would just excrete the excess, and even from supplements. But you can get, if you really overdo it on the supplements, you can have too much potassium, and that can throw off your electrolyte balance. And remember, electrolyte balance is very important for nerve transmission and muscle contraction which makes you think of the heart. So throwing off your electrolyte balance can cause heart irregularities, heart misfiring, and death. So the next mineral on our list is magnesium. Magnesium assists in more than 300 enzymes in the body, so it has a lot of functions, a lot of functions. Uh, the major ones we'll talk about are its functions in the bone. So about 50% of the magnesium in the body is actually found in the bone. Um, but it's also important for nerve impulse transmission and muscle contraction. That's probably starting to sound like deja vu, like a little bit like a broken record. But that is an important function of many of our minerals. They act as these electrolytes that help to signal nerve transduction, and muscle contraction. Um, so the major role for magnesium, though, is um, in the structure of bones and in the immune system. So magnesium can be found in a lot of different foods. Magnesium is a component of chlorophyll, which is that green pigment in plants. And um, so it's can always be found in any green leafy vegetable is going to be a good source of magnesium because green leafy vegetables have lots of chlorophyll, lots of green pigments. You can also find them in various whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds, etc. So here's a chart from your book showing you uh, the magnesium content of various foods. So the uh, recommended dietary allowance of magnesium is 310 or so milligrams a day for women, 420 milligrams a day for men. And then notice here that the upper limit, it's kind of weird, the upper limit is 350 milligrams per day. But 420 milligrams a day is the required amount for men, so how can the upper limit be lower than the RDA, right? Um, this is talking, the upper limit is specifically for supplements. So the form of magnesium in a supplement is called magnesium oxide and that form is much more bioavailable and much more toxic than the form of magnesium that's actually found in food. So the RDA when it comes to getting magnesium from food is actually a little bit higher than 
um, the upper li limit if you're getting it from supplements. So just don't take supplements of magnesium. Um, magnesium deficiency, very rare, is since it's found in so many different types of food, but um, because of its important role in bones, uh, it can lead to one of the risks of deficiency is that it can increase your risk for osteoporosis because it can it lowers blood calcium levels. Um, magnesium toxicity, like I said, only really can occur from supplements, um, or it can actually cause from be caused by kidney failure or kidney kidney disease. So if you take too much in the form of magnesium and in, in form of supplements. It usually just causes like diarrhea, gastrointestinal upset. But if you have true magnesium toxicity from kidney failure and your body consistently is building up magnesium and can't get rid of it, then it causes weakness, nausea, and eventually could cause coma and death. So those are all the major minerals that we're going to talk about, that the book talks about. The next group of minerals are the trace minerals. All right. In iron, zinc, copper, selenium, iodine, fluoride, chromium, manganese, and molybdenum are considered the trace minerals. Um, and I can tell you already that the book forgot to discuss copper, manganese, and molybdenum. Molybdenum. I can't even feel like I say that wrong. Um, and fluoride, which I already discussed. So fluoride has been discussed. But so the book leaves out some discussion of these. So that's, uh, I guess, nice for you, those fewer for you to know. If I was still teaching from my old textbook, you'd have to know them all. Um, but the ones that it leaves out are not particularly uh, important. So the ones that are important you'll know because I'll have more slides about them. Iron being an extremely important trace mineral. Um, iron makes up the uh, oxygen binding portion of hemoglobin, which is the molecule in red blood cells that transports oxygen. So you have these red blood cells, they have this tons of hemoglobin molecules in them. So this is a, a very largely blown up hemoglobin molecule, but hemoglobin is actually very, very small and there's thousands of hemoglobin molecules in a single red blood cell. And a hemoglobin molecule has these four subunits and then it has these little, these little discs here are the heme molecules. So heme looks something like this. You can't really see it very well in this picture, but that circle, that that um, atom in the middle of the heme molecule is iron. And that is where oxygen actually binds. So you can bind four oxygen atoms to one hemoglobin molecule, and that's how oxygen gets transported through the blood. So hemoglobin is the oxygen transporting molecule that's in blood. Hemo means blood. And myoglobin is a very similar protein that's found in muscle cells that also binds oxygen and essentially is how muscle tissue gets oxygen from the blood. It, the myoglobin actually kind of steals oxygen from hemoglobin in the blood and therefore you get, uh, your muscle gets oxygenated. And iron is a very important part of both of those molecules. So iron also has an important um, it's also an important component in a similar molecule called a cytochrome, which in, there's a whole bunch of cytochromes. Um, they're all involved, a lot of them are involved in energy metabolism of the macronutrients, carbs, proteins, and fats. So turning those macronutrients into ATP. Um, iron is important for a lot of enzymes that um, are involved in that metabolism. So there's actually two different types of iron in our diets. Iron can be divided or talked about as heme iron or non-heme iron. So I already just showed you here that these blue discs are called heme groups and they're found in hemoglobin in blood. So what types of food have blood? Are animal foods, right? So meat essentially. So heme iron is going to be iron that's found in meat. It's essentially animal hemoglobin. Non-heme iron is just free iron, usually. So heme iron is bound up in this heme molecule. 
And non-heme iron is just plain free-floating iron that's found in usually plant-based foods. So um, the heme iron happens to be much more absorbable than non-heme iron. So the more heme iron you include in your diet, the better your iron absorption will actually be. Iron absorption can be enhanced by various things. So calcium absorption can be enhanced by vitamin D. Vitamin D helps to enhance calcium absorption. Um, in terms of iron, some things that enhance iron absorption are vitamin C. Vitamin C helps enhance um, iron absorption. So I have a picture of orange juice here and some steak. Uh, I don't know that orange juice and steak really go very well together, but maybe peppers and steak. Peppers are a great source of um, vitamin C, so that would enhance your absorption of iron. Though the iron in steak is already very absorbable because it's heme iron, if you mixed peppers with a plant source of iron, like beans, okay, like beans and peppers, those peppers would help you to absorb more iron from uh, those beans. Also, FYI, cast iron cookware is a good way to enhance iron in your diet. The iron in the cookware, in the cast iron pan, is non-heme iron, but it can actually get infused into the food that you cook uh, in that cast iron skillet. So if you use cast iron skillet to cook food, you actually increase the iron content of that food. The other thing that increases iron content is this thing called meat protein factor. So basically, eating non-heme iron with heme iron increases your absorption. So if you have um, beans and meat together, that heme iron that you get from the meat, the meat will actually help you absorb the non-heme iron that you get from the other food source. There's also a number of different chemicals in food or, or nutrients that can inhibit or impair iron absorption. So several phytochemicals, um, and so phytates, which are in legumes and whole grains, and polyphenols, which are in tea and coffee and red wine, can all inhibit uh, iron absorption. So if you have a glass of red wine with your steak, you actually are inhibiting your iron absorption a little bit. Um, having beans on toast would inhibit the, the whole grain toast. The phytates in the whole grain toast would inhibit iron absorption. And calcium. Calcium actually inhibits iron absorption. So drinking milk with meat or having cheese with meat actually inhibits some of the uh, calcium or inhibits some of the iron absorption. Also something very like totally random but very relevant to me right now, um, being in the third trimester of pregnancy, iron is a very important uh, nutrient for me because the baby's actually stealing a lot of my iron. The baby needs to store iron for itself and its own blood, so um, my iron needs are going way up. But I'm also experiencing a lot of heartburn. So what am I taking for heartburn? Tums. And what does Tums contain? Calcium. So it's something I'm very aware of right now is that my calcium intakes being relatively high but not too high because I'm watching that um, from Tums, okay, could actually be decreasing my iron absorb, impairing my iron absorption, which is something I need to be concerned about. So... If you take Tums or you take a calcium supplement, that can actually impair your iron absorption. Um, something women need to be, pay particular attention to. We'll talk about that in a second when we get to iron adequacy. So iron regulation in the body is done. So interestingly enough, and I just recently learned this, this summer when I took anatomy physiology. I didn't know this because none of my intro textbooks talk about this, but humans actually do not have any regulatory mechanism to get rid of iron. So all of the iron you intake in your body stays in your body unless you lose it through blood loss. Okay? That's pretty much the only way to lose iron is, is by losing blood. So you, um, you eat food that has iron, 
and the GI tract regulates the absorption. So if your body needs iron, your intestines will increase the absorption. If your body doesn't need iron, then your, in, then your intestines won't absorb any iron. That's how it gets regulated. It's regulated by, your body regulates absorption of iron, not excretion of it. It, it can't excrete iron. Though your, your textbook, I think, says that it does, that it excretes it through urine, through urine or something, but it doesn't. Um, so you, you absorb iron and the iron goes to make red blood cells, new red blood cells. And those red blood cells flow through your system for a while, but red blood cells get old and die. And then the spleen breaks them down and that iron gets recycled. So that iron goes back to make more red blood cells. Or if you have excess iron, it can get stored in the liver. So the liver can store some excess iron in order to make new red blood cells and whatever. And when your liver stores are full, then your body stops absorbing new iron. Um, and the only way, again, the only way that we lose iron is through bleeding. Now, men don't bleed, I mean, unless they injure themselves. Um, but women happen to bleed for seven days every month, more or less, give or take. Um, there's some quote, I don't know, remember what movie or book it's from, but some quote that's like, I don't trust anything who can bleed for seven days and not die. Okay, that's women, um, who are on their periods. So, if you notice here, the RDA for iron for women is much, much higher than it is for men. Eight milligrams a day for men, but 18 milligrams per day for women, and that's because women menstruate, and they lose blood, so therefore they lose a significant amount of iron. Um, so people who do not have enough iron in their diet can develop iron deficiency anemia. So essentially anemia is anytime you don't have enough red blood cells. And if you're not producing enough iron, you can't produce red blood cells properly. Um, so iron deficiency anemia can be a result of blood loss, either through menstruation or through injury. It can be from having a diet that's lacking in iron, or it can be from as some condition that causes you to not absorb iron properly from your intestines. And iron deficiency anemia is uh, the most common nutrient deficiency worldwide, both in it's prevalent in America and globally. Um, whereas a lot of these nutrient deficiencies, you really don't see a lot of these mineral deficiencies, you really don't see it in the U.S. at all. But iron deficiency is very common, particularly in young females um, who have just started menstruating, so they're losing a lot of iron, but they are not eating properly and um, not getting enough iron in their diet. Um, people who have higher needs of iron include pregnant women, which I already talked about. Vegetarians who don't eat any heme iron, okay, particularly vegans who don't get any heme iron, so they're basically relying on non-heme iron, um, which is not very bioavailable. And infants and toddlers have higher iron needs because of their, they're growing so quickly, so they're producing, you know, more blood. And um, so they have higher iron needs as well. Um, iron can be toxic, however. Iron deficiency is a real thing, but so is uh, iron toxicity. So iron toxicity can occur if you are taking iron supplements. And it's particularly dangerous for children and is actually a very common cause, the most common cause, of poisoning deaths in children. Because what happens is, uh, they get, so children's vitamins are always like these fun, um, you know, candy flavored sort of, you know, they're like candies. They look like candies, they taste like candies to kids. And if you don't keep an, uh, you know, keep them out of reach of children and children get into them, they can overdose. Uh, on vitamins. And the vitamin that kills them, usually from overdosing on vitamins, is iron. Well, that's not a vitamin, it's a mineral, is iron. So here's an example here of Flintstones with iron. And again, children 
Infants and toddlers have increased need for iron, so a lot of times iron is included in children's vitamins. But there is a warning if you read the back of the bottle. It says, warning, accidental overdose of iron-containing products is a leading cause of fatal poisoning in children under 6. Keep this product out of reach of children. In case of accidental overdose, call a doctor or poison control center immediately. So iron overdose is really a serious and can be a fatal problem for children if they get their hands on these, these vitamins. Um, it starts off with acute vomiting and diarrhea and can quickly progress to liver total liver failure, coma, and death. So uh, if you have kids and they take iron-containing vitamins, Make sure they know that vitamins are medicine and they cannot eat them like candy and you need to keep them out of reach. Um, iron toxicity is pretty rare in adults, mostly because they're aware of toxicity and they don't overdose on vitamins. Um, but another condition where you can have iron toxicity is in a genetic condition called hereditary hemochromatosis, which is a disease where um, people who have this disease, their body absorbs too much iron. So remember, no one really excretes iron unless they're bleeding. In hereditary hemochromatosis, um, the body doesn't regulate iron properly and it absorbs too much and then it builds up to, to toxic levels um, in the body. So people who have this condition often have to be bled regularly and have transfusions in order to get rid of of the extra iron. Zinc is another trace mineral that's important for blood functioning. Copper is too, even though the book doesn't talk about it. Iron, zinc, and copper are all very important for the blood. So zinc is also involved in hemoglobin production like iron is. It's also important for immune function and for wound healing. Those are um, some of the more important roles that we'll talk about. Zinc also is important for your sense of taste and smell. If you have zinc deficiency, one of the signs is a loss of sense of taste and smell. And zinc is required for normal growth. So I meant to insert the picture here from the book where this, um, zinc was first discovered as an essential mineral when um, this doctor in Egypt found this population of Egyptian men that were all um, stunted, growth stunted, and both physically in height and stature and um, sexual matur maturity. So, and they were, when he compared their diets to those of other diets in the area, he found they were deficient in zinc, and replacing zinc in their diet uh, caused them to grow properly again. So, um, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit when it comes to deficiency. So sources of zinc, there's a lot of sources of zinc in the diet, some notoriously high ones. Oysters are notoriously high in zinc, like off the charts high. Um, and But then there's a bunch of other foods, a uh, whole lot of different foods, various foods that have uh, zinc in them. Zinc is fairly high in animal foods, animal products that you'll see. So a lot of these are uh, so baked beans with pork, um, beef, lamb, crab, yogurt, turkey. All those are animal foods that are high on the list here. You also see it in fortified cereals, total, Wheaties, and also in some nuts and seeds um, have, have zinc in them. So um, something about all those metals that are important in the blood, iron, zinc, and copper. Uh, they all inhibit each other's absorption, okay? So non-heme iron will inhibit zinc absorption. Zinc inhibits copper absorption, etc. So um, the issue with that is when it comes to vegetarians. So first of all, a lot of the sources that, that are high in zinc are animal products. Um, and if they have non-heme, if there's non-heme iron, so, so already, zinc is very limited in plant and in plant products when it comes to vegan, vegans and vegetarians. So pecans, lentils, soy milk, they have some zinc, but pretty small amounts here. And if they are eating 
the these products with foods that have non-heme iron, that non-heme iron will inhibit zinc absorption. So vegetarians have slightly higher requirements for zinc and for non-heme iron for that matter. So the uh, recommended amounts for zinc, uh, the RDA is 8 to 11 milligrams per day. The upper limit is 40 milligrams per day. Zinc deficiency is very rare in the U.S. I just talked about the original cases of it in Egypt when it was first diagnosed or first, you know, um, zinc was first identified as an essential nutrient. But it causes that stunted growth. Um, people who are at risk for zinc deficiency are vegans, strict vegetarians who don't eat any animal products, and um, also elderly adults are at risk for it as well. Um, symptoms include a variety, there's a variety of symptoms including loss of appetite, diarrhea, hair loss, slow wound healing, zinc is important for wound healing, and the immune system. Zinc toxicity mainly from um, supplements, not from food. And the supplements for zinc are marketed to help reduce the duration and severity of a cold. So there's different forms. There's cold lozenges that are made out of zinc, like cold ease. Zycam are like more like, I think, Alka-Seltzer tablets, or also you can get like the kind that you spray up your nose. And... Um, they can cause toxicity. So the one that the Zycam that you spray up your nose actually got pulled from the market because it caused people to lose their sense of smell or something from zinc toxicity in the cells in the nose. Um, otherwise, if you do like the lozenge route, it can cause diarrhea, cramps, that kind of um, gastrointestinal upset. And furthermore, those supplements which claim to reduce the duration and or severity of colds don't actually do that. According to scientific research, there's no evidence that suggests that they actually help the common cold. So, um, and they also taste nasty. They have like a metallic, zinc is a metal. They have kind of a metallic taste to them. Um, iodine is another important trace mineral. It's important for making thyroid hormone in your thyroid it's actually in your chest right above your, no, that's your thymus, your thyroid, sorry, in your neck. Uh, remember, your thyroid is involved in calcium regulation. So you have your thyroid, that butterfly-shaped gland, and the back of it is the parathyroid gland. So the thyroid gland um, helps regulate calcium, but the mineral that's very important for regulation of the thyroid is iodine. And the thyroid, not only in regulates calcium levels, but it also regulates the rate of your of metabolism, the rate at which you burn calories essentially. So um, you want to have a healthy thyroid gland and iodine in the diet comes from again all minerals come from soil. Any food that's grown in soil that contains iodine is going to be have a fair amount of iodine in it. But the main source of iodine in the US diet is actually salt. Um, we iodize our salt in this country. So if you go buy like a thing of salt, it usually says iodized salt. We add iodine to it to prevent iodine deficiency because iodine deficiency is not pretty. Um, in adults or I guess children as well who suffer from iodine deficiency, they develop something called a goiter. Essentially, it's the thyroid gland swelling. So the thyroid gland's in your neck, and it swells and gives you, like, this big swollen mass of a neck. Um, because it's swollen, it's not producing enough thyroid hormone. Iodine is needed to produce thyroid hormone. And if you don't get it, it swells, and that's called a goiter. And if pregnant women are iodine deficient, their babies are born... Um, with mental retardation called cretinism. It's a form of mental retardation that's caused by iodine deficiency due to the role of iodine in fetal development and fetal brain development. So this is a picture here of a woman who has goiter and so does this woman. Actually she has a goiter as well. This one is the daughter of the one on the left and she has 
cretinism, this form of mental retardation. So it is a preventable form of retardation if you make sure that you get enough iodine. So that's why we supplement our salt uh, with iodine. So it's very rare. Iodine deficiency is very rare in the U.S., but it's still actually a big problem globally, worldwide, where they don't have access to iodized salt and they don't have a lot of iodine in their soil where they grow food and hence in Bolivia which is where this picture was supposedly taken you still have a high incidence of goiter and cretinism. Iodine toxicity if you get too much iodine actually also causes goiter so uh, it's like it's toxic to your thyroid either way. I, if you have too little iodine or too much iodine, your uh, thyroid gets angry and gets goiter. So um, I had this question in the past, and the book actually touches on this too, because um, I was teaching this class in 2011 when there was that big earthquake in Japan and there was the big that nuclear power plant um, was leaking radioactivity, okay? And... Um, at the time, potassium iodide supplements were being sold to prevent uh, radiation poisoning or certain types of radiation poisoning, and they were flying off the shelf like you couldn't get potassium iodide anywhere. Even in New York, people were buying it up because they were afraid of, you know, radiation traveling or something. So what is the deal with that? What is the deal with iodine and radiation? Well... There is a form, a radioactive form of iodine, and it was one of the radioisotopes that was leaking in this nuclear power plant um, destruction. And that radioactive iodine, just like any iodine, will localize if you, uh, you know, ingest it or breathe it in, if you, your body absorbs it, it will localize to the thyroid gland. And um, that then it will stay in the thyroid gland and it will be radiating its radioactivity and um, that ionizing radiation can cause DNA damage that leads to cancer, cancer of the thyroid and to prevent that you can take these potassium iodide supplements because what happens is the non-radioactive iodine in the pill competes out the radioactive iodine so if you have a little bit of radioactive iodine and you take a shit ton of potassium iodide, that extra iodine will sort of bump out the radioactive iodine and you'll, really, you'll excrete that from your body. And um, it helps. Or another, another way to think about it, I guess, is that if you take the potassium iodide, that'll sort of like fill up all the spots and... Um, you won't need to absorb any more iodine, so your body will excrete instead of absorb the radioactive iodine. So potassium iodide supplements can help to prevent absorption of radioactive iodine, but it doesn't protect you against any other radioactive isotopes, only radioactive iodine. Um, so we're almost done. The last couple of uh, trace minerals, which are um, pretty unexciting, are selenium and chromium. So selenium is, is found in a lot of places. Again, it's found in the soil. Any food that's grown in soil with selenium has selenium. Any produce that's grown in soil with selenium has selenium in it. So selenium also is important for making thyroid hormones, just like iodine is. Selenium is also an important antioxidant. So it joins in that group with those antioxidant vitamins, which is vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin A, and various phytochemicals. Okay, Selenium is the only antioxidant mineral um, as opposed to the vitamins. So it's pretty important for that, and because of its antioxidant function, it is sold as a supplement that is marketed to help prevent um, cancer and heart disease, which remember, antioxidants might play a role in because uh, 
Oxidation is thought to that damages DNA can cause cancer. Oxidation of LDL, bad cholesterol, can lead to atherosclerosis and heart disease. So it's thought that antioxidants help prevent some of these diseases. So selenium is marketed to prevent, you know, on the bottle it might say something like prevents cancer or prevents heart disease. But all research suggests that it's totally inconclusive. Uh, there's no research that supports that selenium does or does not prevent those diseases. So take it at your own risk. Um, toxicity can occur, but it's pretty rare. Also, deficiency is pretty rare because it's in a wide range of foods. Mushrooms are notoriously high in selenium. Um, and then the last one that I'm going to talk about is chromium. Chromium is... Um, one of its important functions is in glucose transport. So um, because of that, because it helps to transport glucose into cells, it's marketed as a supplement to um, treat diabetes or to help type 2 diabetes because it's thought that it increases glucose transport. Again, research there is totally inconclusive. Having enough chromium is important for glucose transport, but having excess amounts of chromium doesn't make you transport glucose better. It's not one of those kinds of relationships. Another thing chromium is marketed for as a supplement, um, it's in the form of chromium picolinate is the supplement form of chromium. And it's um, often you hear it advertised as a way to, as for bodybuilders, to help maximize um, body composition so reduce fat and increase pr increase muscle and again research suggests there's no significant benefit of chromium picolinate on um, body weight and and composition lean lean muscle to fat tissue but it's like a billion dollar industry or something crazy like I don't know maybe it's in the millions but it's something shocking. One of my students did, I used to have my students do um, these like research projects on the different vitamins and minerals and one of my students came back with numbers about chromium picolinate, the market for chromium picolinate in um, athletes and bodybuilders is like millions of dollars but yet there's no research that says it does anything. So, um, you know, save your money I guess. So it's not toxic, though. There's no toxicity effects of taking chromium picolinate. And deficiency is very, very rare, so I won't even talk about what happens if you're deficient. So that is the end of the lecture, on the end of the chapter, on water and minerals. And um, that's the end of the material that you're going to need to know for the next test. So the next test that you should be preparing for now is on chapter 8 and 9, and I guess also on a little bit of chapter 6 about alcohol. That part will be covered. And um, I'm going to make up a, either a video or a written study guide. I haven't decided which yet uh, that I will provide you with soon so that you can um, help better study. But when you're studying the vitamins and minerals, Make sure you know what uh, they are, what um, food sources you can find them in, what the effects of deficiency and toxicity are, and um, that's those are the major points. I'll make a study guide. I'm not on top of it right now. Okay, so micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, and then also water. That's the topic the topics of the last two lectures and the topic for the next exam it's only two chapters but they were two long chapters so it's a lot of material so don't procrastinate it don't put it off don't think it's easy because it's two chapters because it's a lot more information there's a lot more vitamins and minerals your head's probably spinning a little bit actually after these last two lectures so rewatch them if you need to review the material, and practice, practice, practice in the Connect software. That's the best way to study, okay? Um, just keep drilling those flashcards. And, um, and good luck. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.